And turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 to 4. In the Pew Bibles, that's page 1044, 1044. This is part of a letter that uh, two blokes, Paul and Timothy, wrote to a bunch of God's people in a town called Colossae. And as we'll find out in a moment, they start to think about in this part what it looks like to live as one of God's people. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, How would you describe 2022? I've already had one chat with one person this morning as they walked in where they said, gee, I'm glad 2022's finished. Uh, It was the year we were supposed to come out of the pandemic, but it still lurks and leans over everything, doesn't it? Even over relationships between countries. Uh, If you look back over the year, it was the year when we lost very significant figures from our social, political and sporting landscape. And some of those losses and the age of the people who died caused a lot of introspection and self-examination within our community. That was the year when our landscape was flooded and parts of South Australia are still dealing with it at the moment. It was the year, like many in the last few years, where many within our community experienced very heightened levels of anxiety and distress. Uh, It was the year when the future looked more and more clouded and ominous especially as you looked at international politics and how aggressive it was as living costs rose, even putting a roof over your head seems out of reach for so many people. It was the year when we lost a monarch that no one really thought would die, did they? When dictatorships became more entrenched across global nations, where even a country as stable as Britain seemed to just churn through prime ministers and where we even changed our own government. It was the year when we in the West finally began to see the fruits of a growing anti-Christian sentiment as football club presidents lost their jobs because they followed Jesus, where a book called Being the Bad Guys helped us to see where we fitted in public opinion. How would you summarise such a year? I would say that we live in more anxious times than any that I can remember. I think we probably live in a time where individuals are far more driven than I can remember, far busier than I can remember. And I think we probably live in times, due to growing technology, which are far more distracted than ever before. So what's the good life look like? Is is a good life possible? Can you attain it? Is it even out there? After such a year, the good life in our world seems only attainable through constant hard work and grind, through making sure you keep up with all those around you In such a year, the good life seems so confused because everywhere you look and whatever screen you turn on, you have another alternative. In such a time, we need to remember the good life that comes with Christianity, the good life that God himself offers At such a time, we need to dig more deeply into things that have become so familiar we just say them and remind ourselves how good it is to be someone who knows Jesus. And that's our aim over the series over the next few weeks, the good life that comes from being part of God's people. Let me pray and we're going to dive into the first part now. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It really is glorious to see you here with fans and sunshine with a large mob of people, just to sit here in peace, uh, security, 
uh, some level of tranquility and open your word and read it. Father, thanks that you speak to us. Uh, Your word isn't dusty or dull. Uh, Your word is living and active. Your word isn't blunt, but it's incredibly sharp. Father, please help us to understand the good life, how good it is to be connected to Jesus and one of your mom. We pray it in his name. Amen. I don't know if you remember, but we actually spent 2020, we we spent a whole term in Colossians. Uh, If you want to go and revisit those series, they're on our website. You can do that with any of our sermons over the next few weeks. If you're traveling, hop online. Uh, We still live stream at 9 a.m. And if you miss the sermon, you can catch up. Uh, We spent 2020 in Colossians. Back then, you'll remember there was a slightly taller, balder bloke who was helping us go through that. Neil and me took us through Colossians. Uh, Colossians is all about transfer and transform. Transfer and transform. God's people change their address from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's son, Jesus. God's people are transferred. They move from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's son. And that transfer brings a transformation. Jesus is now the boss. As that song mentioned, we now follow Jesus. He shapes our life. And as Paul and his co-writer Timothy write to a mob of God's people in a town called Colossae, a group of people are starting to distract God's mob, saying, hey, why don't you add this on? Why don't you follow this special diet? Why don't you memorise these verses? Why don't you spend time on this holiday? And Paul and Timothy say, hey, don't do that. Stick with the basics. Stick with the basics. Stick with the truth about Jesus. Uh, When you open Colossians chapters 1 and 2, look at what the truth about Jesus is, what what the transfer and transform look like. And then chapters 3 to 4 say, well, you're going to wake up on Monday morning, you're going to go to work, you're going to go to mother's group, you're going to go and play sport. What will it look like on Monday morning? Chapters 1 and 2 help you look at the transfer and transform. Chapters 3 and 4 help you look at what it applies to your life on Monday morning. To understand the good life, we need to understand its shape and substance. We're at point two. Uh, The key verse in today's passage is verse three. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. This verse unlocks this whole section because it reminds us of the shape and substance of of being one of God's people. It summarises all the first two chapters and kicks us into the second two. Did you see what word kicks the verse off? For. For. Uh, When you see that word, you go, ah, here's the foundation of everything that's going to come. Here's the reason. Here's the explanation. For, where's the life of the Christian now? Is it in the parish directory of Narrabri Anglican Church? Is it in the fact that you were baptised and confirmed and have never been back to church since? Is it shaped by the fact that you turn up at Christmas and Easter? Now, do you notice where it's shaped there in verse 3? For your life is now where? Hidden with Christ. If you had to draw an outline of the life of the Christian, the outline looks like Jesus. The outline looks like Jesus. What does that mean? That's really helpful, isn't it? Well, if you scan through verses 1, 2, and 4, you'll notice a really important phrase that's repeated, with Christ. It's there in verse 1. It's unpacked in verse 2. It's there in verse 3. It's there in verse 4. In those four verses, the Christian is someone who has died with Christ, been buried with Christ, been raised with Christ, now has their life hidden with Christ. If you had to summarise the shape of the Christian life, it's with Christ, isn't it? It covers the past, it covers the present, and it covers the future. The shape and substance of the life of the Christian is with Christ. So what does that mean? Uh, it really helps to understand that little word with, doesn't it? Because that's 
the hinge. If you look in Colossians chapter 1, verse 4, you'll notice that God's people have faith in someone. They have faith in Christ Jesus. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, that's unpacked a little more. You were buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through what? Through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. That little word with means trusting Jesus, having faith in him, being so joined to him by trusting him that your life is inseparable from him. You've heard about him. You've heard what he said. You've seen what he's done. You believe it's true. You take what he says and does and you trust it and then you live like it. What does that mean? Where where does that get you? I'm going to see if I can work some slides here. We'll see how we go. Uh, It means that you are forgiven. Look in Colossians 1 verses 13 to 14. Colossians 1, 13 to 14. He's rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Because you are connected to Jesus, you can have your sins forgiven. Now, the sheet up on the top left isn't my mass test results. It's kind of like a summary of the life of a human being. It's full of crosses because none of us measure up to God's standard. Those crosses are called sin. We've heard a lot about sin over the last few years. It's a really simple word, if you like. It's got I in the middle or it's the attitude and action that says I'm God and God's not. It means that we're the enemies of God by nature. It means that we are under God's judgment. We want life without him and God says, no worries. And if you have life without the author of life, you have death, don't you? And no human can do anything about it. None of us can change it. None of us can reverse our nature. We need the one we sinned against to come in and do something about it, to forgive it and wipe our slate clean so that we have a blank sheet of paper. Uh, If you notice down that in the second pass, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Jesus is God in the flesh. He lived the life we could never live but so desperately need to. He did that as a complete human being resisting sin. He then died on the cross, taking all of our judgment for us, even though he didn't deserve it. And so he was raised from the dead, and that showed that our judgment was paid. If you are connected to Jesus, you have all of your sins forgiven, past, present, and future. I want you just to take 30 seconds to think about how significant that is. I want you to think about how good that is to have every sin forgiven. All that Jesus did so that you could have all your sins forgiven, you could be reconciled to God and you could have peace with him. You can have a blank sheet. But it gets even better, and I'm, I'm not a dem tell that, okay? It gets even better. Because one of the dilemmas we have is that now that Jesus has given us a blank sheet, what, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> My temptation is to try and fill that with good deeds, isn't it? <laughs> and the problem is that if I fill that with good deeds, that's where I'm going to end up, or way back at the start, because... I can do nothing by myself. So I've got a problem. I've got a problem. I'm forgiven. But I now need to live in a way that's acceptable to come into the presence of God. I need to be perfect and filling it with my own good deeds is not going to do it, is it? But God fills it with all of Christ's good deeds. 
in Jesus, not only are my sins forgiven, I am then given all of his perfection. Not only are my sins forgiven, I'm then given all of his perfection. You were once alienated and hostile in mind because of your evil action. But now he's reconciled you by his physical body through his death. What's he going to do with you now? To present you holy, faultless and blameless before God. Uh, That holy, faultless and blameless isn't going to be because of our good deeds, is it? (laughs) It's going to be because of all of Jesus' perfection. God credits that to us. God gives that to us. God grants that to us with Christ Your sins are forgiven. With Christ, you are given all of Jesus' perfection. With Christ, your judgment is paid. With Christ, you can walk into the presence of God with all of Jesus' perfection. The Bible calls this justification. Your sins are forgiven, and now you are perfect with Christ. I don't know if you remember the series from 2020, but Neil had a great phrase. His story is your story. His story is your story. He lived the life you couldn't live to die the death you deserved. He was raised from the death to show your judgment had been paid. And by faith, God then gives you all of his perfection. It's really important for us to understand when this happens. It happens now. It happens now. To be with Christ now means that every sin is paid for and you are completely perfect before God. There's no waiting period. It's not like getting uh, private medical health care. You've got to have a parole period of three months before you can start claiming those glasses. No, you've got it all now. You've got all of Jesus' perfection now and all of the forgiveness You don't have to meet any KPIs. You don't actually have to reach a bar. By trusting in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and all of his perfection is yours. It's really important to notice that that is only by being connected to Jesus. With Christ. Not with your family tree. (laughs) Not with your good upbringing. Not with your good deeds but with Jesus. With Jesus, you are completely forgiven and you are now in the sight of God. For eternity, you are now perfect. And so your future is assured. Look at verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, what will happen? Then you also will appear, there's that phrase again, with him in glory. You will have everything he has. You will stand there before God, fully transformed forever. That's good, isn't it? (laughs) To be forgiven and to be perfect. The shape of the Christian life, its substance is with Christ. I'm at point three on the outline. It's with Christ. With Christ, your sins are forgiven. With Christ, you have all of his perfection now. With Christ, you are completely acceptable to God today. With Christ, your future is set. So so let me unpack four good outcomes from being with Christ. First, your identity is defined by him. Look at verse 3 again. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The identity of the Christian, the life of someone who is with Christ, is defined by Jesus. His perfect life is yours. His completely sufficient and efficient death for your sins is yours. His resurrection from the dead, historically and physically, is yours. His eternity is yours. Your identity is shaped by Jesus. It's not defined by your career. It's not defined by your good deeds or your charity work. 
It's not defined by your perfect parenting. It's not defined by your family tree, your friendship network, your material possessions, your ability to appear together, even your capability to match your social class. Your identity is not proven by your education. Your identity is with Jesus, the man who lived perfectly for you, who died sufficiently for you, who rose really from the dead. If you are with Christ, you are defined by him alone. Uh, Let me just dig a little deeper. That means that no event in your past is beyond the forgiveness of God. That means no event in your present will overcome the certainty of perfection with Christ. That means no instability now, no rise in living expenses or damage in global politics will destroy your future, which is glorious. Your identity is with Christ. Secondly, the security of the Christian is founded with Christ. The if in verse 1 is really important. If Jesus did live and die and rise for you, if by faith you're with Christ, if his death and resurrection has paid the judgment for your sins, if all his perfection is now yours, and that if is true, then you have complete security, don't you? About your past, in the present, and for tomorrow. Our world is so transient. We can't even keep prime ministers in stable countries. Our world is so distracting. Every time you press a button, you have an alternative vision for your life. Our life is so unstable socially, politically, in terms of the media. But this is bedrock, isn't it? No time traveller can go back in history and undo what God has done in Jesus. Nothing can limit its sufficiency or comprehension. Nothing can change its truth, and that's you with Christ. Is that that good? Is that secure? It's marvellous, isn't it? Third, the future of the Christian is completely assured. In a world where everything seems to change every single minute, in a world where our leaders run on a 24-hour news cycle dictated by Instagram, In a world where a civilised country can invade another civilised country and have no consequences. In a world where you can change your virtual identity with the stroke of a computer key. In a world where over a decade the whole of society gets turned on its head. Tomorrow for me is secure. Tomorrow for you is secure if you are with Christ. You might be the subject of a really vicious social media campaign. The downturn in the property market might take the roof from over your head. Rising petrol prices might mean you cannot drive your car. Expensive vegetables and meat might mean that you change your diet. The vagaries of the weather might wipe out your crop. But when Christ returns, what do you have? You are the most significant people in the universe. You are glorious. You are perfect. You can walk into God's throne room and look him in the eye and say, Hello, Father. Your future is set with Christ. Fourthly, with Christ, the distractions of life can be confronted. Look at verses 1 and 2. So if you've been raised with remember that if is certain, if you've been raised with Christ, Seek the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, often people get to this passage, oh, it confirms that Christians just have their heads in the clouds. They don't deal with the real world. You'll find out next week that that's a load of garbage. Now, Christians deal with the real world. They go into all the darkest nooks and crannies of their own hearts. But this is a command to say... If your life is shaped by Christ, your life is not shaped with the world. Your sins are forgiven. The life where you thought you were God instead of God has gone. 
and now your life is hidden with Christ. And that means that phrase, with Christ, shapes all your decisions. Sin is a real and concrete danger until Jesus returns. But let me tell you that sin doesn't just rear its head in spectacular and monumental moments. Sin slithers in in smaller daily decisions about my dollars and my diary, about my work and my words, the words I speak to my children and my spouse, the thoughts I have about my neighbours and my work colleagues, the words that I put on my social media account and the glances that I just have of what other people have. Sin doesn't land like a nuclear bomb. Sin slithers in like a snake into the little, small decisions that form the chain of daily life. They're the distractions, aren't they? And because you are with Christ, you can confront them. You can set your minds on things above, not on earthly things because your life is with Christ. So let me finish very quickly by just digging into what that might look like on Monday morning, on the second day of 2023. Here are four things to consider. They're there on your outline. First, someone will ask you this week, how are you? What will you say? Uh, If I'm tempted to be obnoxious, I might say I'm perfect, thanks. But it's the truth, isn't it? Is it? I'm not well because my bones creak. Every day brings me closer to the grave. But I am perfect because all of Christ's perfection is mine. How are you? What a daily moment to pause and consider how you really are eternally with Christ. And think about how you might respond in a way that brings someone else to think about that eternal future. Second, you might have a new diary. It's shiny and glossy at the moment, isn't it? It's not tattered. It's not full. But how are you planning 2023? You've already started planning, haven't you? How are you planning with Christ? I read a terrific article this week. I've run off 25 copies. They're up there under the money tip. And it just says, plan 2023 with the Ten Commandments. And it just lists the Ten Commandments and unpacks it with a series of questions that help us think through those daily life link chains where sin might slither in. How are you going to plan 2023? With Christ? Thirdly, It's only the morning of the first day of 2023. And I suspect many of us are already anxious, aren't we? There's a month that just looks overwhelming already, so busy that I'm already tearing out my minimal hair. I'm already anxious about rising property costs, interest rates, petrol prices. I'm anxious about my future, not only my future, but the future of my parents who are slowing down. I'm anxious about what my children are going to do, where they're going to live, what's it... There might even be something from our past that is lurking over us. A decision we made today that is worrying us. Plans for tomorrow that already look uncertain. Please remind yourself how certain is your future if you are with Christ? What has happened to your past? Who are you in the present? How confident can you be of facing Christ if he returns by lunchtime? It's all said, isn't it? Finally, how will you confront your distractions when it comes to the command to seek the things above? There is a really simple way to do it, isn't there? The really simple way is just to open the Bible each morning and read. Read God's Word. I've printed off two Bible reading plans up the back. I've got to make a public confession. I've never read the Bible in a year. I'm going to give it a go this year. Just work through God's word daily. Chug my way through it, confronting the distractions 
and being reminded daily, I'm with Christ and life is good. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that by your grace and mercy and love, by trusting completely in what Jesus has done, our sins can be forgiven and we are given all of his perfection. Father, thank you that this is the good life. It deals with our past. It sets our feet firmly in the present and it gives us a certain future. Father, thank you for the goodness of this. Father, in this town, in our families, in our work, in our sport, in our leisure, help us to publicly display that goodness you have given so that many other people in this town can have the good life. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Elsie, up the back. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Good question. How will I explain to people if I decide to go with the obnoxious answer of I'm perfect? Uh, the reason I would do that is to create a conversation. Uh, I'm not doing it because I want to trumpet anything about me, but what I want to say to people is you too can meet Jesus. Am I perfect now before God? Yes, I am. Colossians 2 verse 6, I'm already seated at the dinner table with God. God looks at me and goes, you are perfect. Have I gotten used to that? No, I haven't. That's next week's sermon. Next week's sermon that Phil is going to bring us is all about how we get used to what God has already made us completely. And so next week, Elsie, you'll understand what that looks like as we deal with what God has already fully made us. So maybe you might not be as obnoxious as me, and that would be a wise thing. But maybe you might say, actually, I'm really good. I'm really good because I know Jesus. And there's a conversation opened up.